Hi, thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm Ellie from the University of York. So I'm going to talk about this project that Lisa Emerson's a PI of. She couldn't be here today. So the background to the project is related to farming in southern Africa. So I think everyone probably knows this. About 70% of farmers in sub-Saharan Africa are subsistence farmers. So they rely on the produce that they produce in order to eat. There's been a recent food security alert. 45 million people are predicted to be food insecure this year due to the cyclones that we had last year and drought and flooding this year as well. The population is expected to rise to about 87 million by 2050. And most of the farming is hand. It's all by hand. There's very little mechanization. And there's also very little use of oxen or uh, animals as well. So it's mainly by hand. It's usually just agriculture, there's some pastoral, but very little. And the impacts of climate change are really going to affect agriculture into the future. So we really need some kind of climate resilient farming system that can really help to improve food security. And this picture here is maize, and the one on the, the side closest to me um, is under a new system called conservation agriculture, and the one on the further side is um, current maize cultivation and that was under a trial condition um, which was under a drought condition basically so the conservation agriculture really helped um, so one of the methods of trying to improve resilience is through climate smart agriculture so climate smart agriculture we've heard quite a bit of um, over yesterday lots of people are involved in it so it's basically trying to make um, <laughs> cultivation so that it reduces contribution to greenhouse gases, it's sustainable and it's resilient and it produces food for people. So some examples are conservation agriculture which we'll come into a minute, but also different types of dairy development, there's catfish agriculture, agroforestry, climate smart villages. There's a whole range of different climate smart agricultural techniques. So the one we've been working with in Malawi looks at conservation agriculture, which I mentioned earlier. So it has three main pillars. One is minimum tillage. So trying to move people away from ploughing and having ridge and furrow, and mainly towards very little tillage, so having planting basins and not destroying the soil structure. The aim of that is to try and retain soil moisture. We also are looking at intercropping or crop rotation, so rather than just having maize, uh, intercropping it with... <coughs> Uh, different types of other crops or cover crops, uh, even agroforestry as well, and putting a mulch down on the soil, so often the maize stalks, maize stover, and that's to try to reduce evapotranspiration. So it's predominantly in maize systems, and in Malawi it's usually through government uh, policy and facilitated through NGOs. So an NGO will go to a community and will encourage people to use conservation agriculture. They'll give them the techniques to do it, so they'll teach them. They'll give them seeds and uh, different inputs as well, such as fertilizer. But it, despite this being a policy of the government and being really facilitated and funded, um, there's only about 3% adoption. So very few farmers are actually doing it. And there's also disadoption, so that's when farmers stop doing it. And this tends to happen when the NGO withdraws. So an NGO might be there for three years, doing a lot of training, um, teaching people how to use conservation agriculture. But then when they leave, the farmers go back to doing what they were doing before. So they disadopt, which obviously is really unsustainable, isn't achieving what we want, which is a resilient agricultural system. And it's also really expensive. So much money goes into training people to do conservation agriculture. And if people stop doing it, then that money is completely wasted. So our key findings from this project were that there are four main pillars that are involved in um, farming. So the environment's really important, how much it rains, soil quality, temperature. Governance as well, so land rights, what support and education people have. If you don't own the land that you're working on, you don't really mind what happens to it in its long-term future. You want to get out something out of it now. But if you have that land, if it's your land, you're more likely to want to look after it for the future. Then the social impacts are really important too. So what's happening in a household? So health, do, are people healthy enough to actually go and work on the land? Conservation agriculture is more labor intensive at certain times of the year. It tends to be in February and March. That's when you need to go out weeding, weeding by hand. 
but that's also the time when malaria is high and also it's the lean season where you've run out of food from the year before. So all these things happen at the time when you need to have the highest labour. There's also rural to urban migration that affect it as well. And also your economics, so where you can store it, availability of inputs and subsidies. So this comes out to a uh, quite a confusing diagram, but mainly four pillars, economic, social, governance and environment that really affect that food system. And if we look across all those uh, four pillars to try and work out what impacts agriculture, then we can hopefully try and work out where we can intervene and help people to keep doing uh, climate smart agriculture. So currently, there's lots of models that are involved in farming, but they often tend to just look at one or two different factors. So you have biophysical crop models, economic conversion, household food security, but they tend not to look at across the whole system, but only maybe one or two uh, parts of it. So what we want to do with this project is try and work out how we can combine data from across all four different pillars and see what patterns are emerging that we might not be aware of. If you just work in one small area, you might only pick up one or two different patterns, but by looking up across all of them, a really cross-sector, there might be different patterns emerging. So the aim of the project was to get hold of some large data sets and run the models on those and try and find out what patterns emerge. And from that, um, work out how we can actually provide tailored advice to farmers that will actually help them. So in terms of data, um, we collected some data from our contacts in Malawi. So we work with CIMIT, which is the maize and wheat centre. Um, so they run lots of different projects in Malawi and collect loads of data. So they had data on rainfall, types of yields, uh, different crops, planting systems, harvesting time, and also household data as well. So how many people are in the household, how big the farming area is, who actually works the land, what the soil is like, and that kind of thing. And then from STFC, we have larger data sets, so satellite data, rainfall, NDVI, and models as well. So the aim of that was to put it all into an AI system and do something to it. So that's at Darsbury. Um, someone's hopefully doing something to it there. Unfortunately, I know absolutely nothing about the AI side of this project at, at all. So the aim of that is to look at those data sets and find out what patterns are emerging and then see how we can use it. So using digital technologies, so apps, mobile phones, services, weather forecasts, plant and weed identification, all these different things that farmers can use themselves. But we have to be really careful to make sure that it's accessible to everybody. So often in different parts of Africa, the mobile phone signal is not that great. So you can see this image on the left-hand side. Um, that was the only spot you could get phone signal. So you always found loads of people standing on top of that hill next to the road trying to get phone signal. So if we're trying to encourage farmers to use different digital technologies, we need to make sure they're accessible. And if people can't access them, what routes can we put in place to help them to do so? And it also can extend to different drones and satellite systems, so provision advice as well, and hopefully feed into policy too. So what's next for this project? So we're hoping, well we have, we have submitted this. We've submitted a funding proposal to the GCRF DEDA call which is Digital Innovation for Development in Africa. And the aim of that is to build networks across Southern Africa, so expanding from the work we've been doing in Malawi across Southern Africa and getting hold of some larger data sets. Um, and then with a particular focus on women and minority groups as well, and try to identify those digital technologies that can be used. Um, so that's that project so far, so thank you very much. Brilliant. <laughs>